All right, so I'm just, whoops, I'm just reorienting myself here a little bit. All right, so um, I'm going to get started. Like I just said, uh, my name is Dr. William Schmachtenberg, uh, Day Miami in Second Life, and um, I have the honor to also be working with uh, Curious George at Caltech. I'm going to say a little bit more about that collaboration because, after all, that's what Science Circle is about is getting scientists connected um, and doing really cool projects. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I've been on Second Life for quite a while. Uh, I am, am the uh, adjunct, I should say, associate uh, research associate for Virginia Tech, also the Virginia Museum of Natural History. I taught for 30 years at a high school in Virginia and about 19 years at Ferrum College in Southwest Virginia, so it's a quick bio. And I, I wanted to say that because one of the things that really surprised me was I spent the last 32 years in Virginia, and right now I'm up in New York. I'm with my mom, actually. Uh, she's getting a chance to see my presentation, which is cool. And uh, one of the things that struck me was after I retired in 2021, I was kind of surprised that um, to find out that there were several craters um, in uh, the Kentucky area. And there was one in particular in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, that I didn't know anything about. Nobody had said anything to me about it. Um, and I thought, gee, I'm retired. I'm going to jump in my car and spend a week and go down there and, and check it out. Um, and that's what this talk is all about. So this is uh, a boots on the ground uh, analysis of a um, crater in Kentucky. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes before I started the talk, if any of you have any questions, I'm going to keep the local chat open. And um, if there's a geology question, I'm going to do the best I can to answer that. I'm glad Curious George is here because he helped me with some of the astrophysical connections, the astrophysics uh, calculations. Um, so I'm hoping that he will jump in. Uh, we're going to get to that in a minute, Abba. Um, and uh, also Synergy said he was going to throw some things in local chat. So this will be a fun discussion. But um, feel free at any time during the talk, if you want to make a comment or a question, put it in there and we'll answer it. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to say is that there's quite a bit of math in here. And I wasn't sure about how to address that. You notice that there's a box. Uh, underneath my slide projector that says click here to get the notes and link to slides. Um, I would ask everyone at this point to, yeah, go ahead. I see people clicking on it already if you haven't done so already. And grab that. That's got my contact information in it. Um, it also has all of the calculations that Curious George did. Um, and you may, if you have a printer nearby, maybe you can throw it in a text editor and print it out. That's what I did because I find it easier when I've got all this math to take a look at it. And I don't want people to log off when you hear a lot of math. <laughs> There's some people that are just phobic when it comes to math. Um, well, I, looking through what Curious George did, it's at the level of Algebra 2 and, and high school physics. So there's not a lot of calc. I know there's some people that like math, but I, for some reason I've run into a bunch of people on, on Science Circle that are really scared of math. Um, and that's the thing that struck me is when I looked through um, George's analysis, this sort of thing can and should be done at the high school level to get kids excited about science, and then it's not happening. I don't know why. All right. So anyway, um, like I said, my contact information is there. All right, so let's get started. And one of the first things that I thought about is, are there meteorite impacts? Are they, are they rare or are they fairly common in the United States? So what I did was um, I was getting trained on Esri's uh, GIS software. And um, so what I did was I was able to get a lot of data on meteorite, meteorite impacts that have been found on the uh, United States. And here's what the shocker was. I'm going to give it a minute to res. There are a lot of them, Sumo, absolutely. And if you can, cam into my map there. Every one of those dots there is a confirmed meteorite strike on the United States. It's just, we're in a shooting gallery. There's just a ton of these things that keep hitting um, 
uh, keep hitting the United States. And I'm not sure what the oldest impact is there. I'd have to check it out. I can tell you that, I'm going to get to this in a minute, that at least we're getting 450 million years somewhere in there. I don't know if that's the oldest one. Yeah, I don't have good age data on it, but that, that's good questions. I know uh, there's one around Chesapeake Bay that's only 15 million years, and yeah, there is an erosion problem. All right, so like I said, uh, I lived in Virginia for 30 years, so I was interested in, you know, have there been meteorites found in Virginia? And the answer is yes. Um, and I counted about 14 or 15 of them. Every one of those little dots there represents a meteorite, confirmed meteorite that's been found in Virginia. And some of them are rich in iron. Some of them are stony meteorites. If you zoom in the color pattern, I think is blue is iron. And um, yeah, red is, yeah, blue are iron meteorites and red are stony meteorites. Oh, thanks. I appreciate Phil for throwing in um, data on um, the age of meteorites. Cool. Everything. Looks like a map of the Civil War battlefields. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any relationship between Civil War battlefields and meteorite impacts. All right. Uh, as I already mentioned, probably one of the most famous uh, meteorite sites, craters, uh, near Virginia is the one that's off the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, this one is about 85 kilometers uh, in diameter. It formed about 35 million years ago. Um, and not many people knew about it. Uh, there was a bunch of scientists that were studying freshwater supplies near the coast of Virginia and found that there was a lot of seepage of very high salinities in um, some of the... Uh, the groundwater supplies and people started to ask why is there so much salt in their fresh water and they determined that there was a crater off the coast of Virginia and this impact probably may have even have somehow influenced it didn't totally form the Chesapeake Bay area as I'm told but it may have had an influence to it all right and then after that, what I did was I, um, I found out that there are several sites in Kentucky that um, are confirmed meteorite sites or craters. Um, maybe they're asteroid craters, depending on the size. Um, and there were three in particular that I was interested in looking at. And how about you? I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Uh, there's a Drethra knob. That's a impact site of Versailles structure, and then there's a Millsboro structure. And the whoops, and the Kentucky Geologic Survey has done a really great job um, in studying these and coming up with field guides, and have done a number done a number of field trips, and I use them in, in planning my trip. So let's take a look at the, my trip to. Um, Millsburg, Kentucky, and the one that I wanted to go to the closest one to me was just to the west of um, the Cumberland Gap. The Cumberland Gap is in the tri-state area between Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And yeah, I, I, could, I had to get a shot of the Cumberland Gap. And there's a lot of history that's involved here. Uh, it turned out the early settlers, when they wanted to go from New York or Pennsylvania, whatever, the big problem they ran into was the Appalachian Mountains. Um, you know, when you're talking the 1700s, 1800s, this map, the Appalachians formed a very formidable barrier towards exploration of the West. And any sort of gaps were greatly appreciated by the early settlers, and the Cumberland Gap was one of the big ones. Um, and at first they, tr they got through, it was a rather small opening, but they were able to enlarge it over time. They uh, obviously had problems with the Indians. And there's a whole uh, visitor center at the Cumberland Gap where they go into the history of this particular region. Um, but what I was interested in was uh, the asteroid crater that's located just to the west of, of the Cumberland Gap. And here's a picture 
Not, not a very good one, though, on the left of me standing on an overlook uh, from um, from the of the uh, Millsboro crater, and it's not a really great shot of the crater area. There's, uh, and as somebody was saying, there's been a lot of weathering and erosion, so the crater walls um, are sort of have been removed. Uh, the picture on the right is a satellite image of the area, and you see a black dot uh, right above a white line. That is the Millsboro's crater, and that's. That feature sort of stood out. People at first started to look at these satellite images, started to ask, you know, why is a, why do you have this red, big red dot, okay, to the north and west of, um, you know, this white line here? Uh, it's not the sort of typical uh, feature that you would see in the um, Appalachian Mountains. All right, and here's a picture uh, taken from within the Millsboro Crater area. And I was really shocked rolling into, um, rolling into Millsboro, Kentucky, because um, there's a whole town there that's developed within this uh, asteroid crater. And you can see uh, some of the crater walls there. And one thing I need to mention before we go on that scientists have pretty much figured out is that you're not seeing the original crater of uh, Millsboro. Um, they suspect that you're seeing a, a deeply eroded pit that was uh, below the crater. And one of the questions that I think Sumo or someone brought up earlier, they said, well, how old is the Millsboro crater? You know, what was the age of the impact? And the answer is we don't know, all right? If you look at some of the other uh, craters in Kentucky, for example, Jethro Knob in Kentucky, um, we have a great example of a, a time-constrained impact event. All right, so we know that the crater around Jethro Knob in Kentucky uh, formed in rocks that are 445 million years, and then in the middle of the crater, you've got flat Silurian rocks that are 450 million years. So we know the impact had to have occurred between 415 and, and 445 million years ago, which is really cool. All right, the problem is with the Millsboro um, Kentucky crater, we don't have that kind of constrained ages. What we've got is we can look at the sides of the crater walls like this, and we can see nice extensive coal deposits in it, um, and that's it. All right, and once you start talking about coal, um, scientists and geologists figured out pretty quickly that you're dealing with carbonif carboniferous age rocks somewhere around maybe 300 million years old. But we have no rocks uh, in the center uh, that formed after the impact, or if they did form, they were eroded away. So all we can say is that this impact in Millsboro, Kentucky, formed sometime after 300 million years ago, and that's it. And it's a shame we can't constrain the age more than that because there's a whole bunch of interesting questions to be asked. Things like, did this impact event uh, have any effect on extinction rates, for example, at least locally in the area? We know that there were several mass extinctions that occurred after 300 million years ago. There was the one at the end of the Permian um, about 280 million years ago. There was one at the end of the Triassic. There was um, about 200 million years ago. There was one, the famous one is the end of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Um, so we have no idea whether they uh, affected it or not. And I don't know of any way of narrowing it down uh, because we just don't have the, the evidence. By the way, keep this graphic in mind. I meant to repeat it of these nice flat layered um, coal deposits because that'll be important later on in the discussion. All right, uh, so what's the evidence for impact within the crater? Um, I took this picture in the very center of the crater. Uh, it's a conglomeratic layer, and if you look real careful in the image, you can see some vertical cracks from the impact event. Um, they've also found characteristic cone and cone structures, which scientists have argued is typical of an impact area. If you drive around to the side of the crater, um, around where the hotel is, 
you can see that there are um, there are uh, faults or cracks in the um, uh, in the shales that form on the side of the um, of the crater. And since G is asking, why would the cracks be vertical? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it all has to depend upon uh, the the impact. You might think normally when stresses are applied to rocks, they occur at a 60 degree angle. Um, but in this case, just about every fault that I saw or crack was at a 90 degree angle. You know, and one thing I was thinking about was when this object came in, was it perpendicular or did it come in at a bleak angle? Um, my way of thinking about it is that it probably came in almost vertical because um, if it came in at an angle, then um, it would have created more of an oval um, crater. And it did. I mean, the thing is almost perfectly circular. All right, here's a graphic showing um, an artist's rendition of the asteroid coming in and breaking apart uh, as just before it hit the Millsboro, Kentucky area. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the math that is involved with um, the um, calculation. Because one of the things that is always fun to look at when you have these asteroid impact areas is, um, you know, how fast was it traveling? Uh, what was the mass of the, or what was the size of the object? What was the object made of? And, um, you know, the question really is a matter of, um, you know, there are a lot of unknowns that are here, and we can sort of take some guesses or estimates of, um, you know, what may be involved. But, you know, one of the things I noticed when I went to the Cumberland Gap area, they just gave a single-page handout, and they said, well, yeah, this is what we think. We think it was traveling so fast, we think it was this size. But they really didn't get into the details of the math, and that's really crucial to understand this math and understand what the errors are involved with it. And that's something that I talked to George about as well, is that some of the numbers that I'm going to be giving you could indeed um, be uh, different from what we're assuming. All right, so first thing that we start with here, and again, if you haven't done so already, please click on the box below the slide projector. It'll give you these um, in more detail. So the first thing that George suggests that I look at is there was a study that was done uh, with 20th century atom bomb blasts. The United States and the Russians, as you know, in uh, the uh, 20th century uh, set off nuclear bombs at the time of World War II uh, to learn about the destructive pattern of atomic weapons. And one of the things that they determined was that there was a relationship between the size of the bomb, the amount of energy that was released, and um, the... Um, and the size of the crater that resulted from uh, the, uh, the explosion. And uh, that's given here. Energy is equal to 9.1 times 10 to the 24th times the diameter of the crater raised to 2.59 power, uh, where E is the kinetic energy of the um, incoming near-Earth asteroid, and D is the diameter of the crater. So we've got one relationship uh, between energy and the size of the crater. One of the, and I have not seen the actual graph here, and, and maybe George can address this as well, but I know there was a comment in the paper that I read um, that's, that's listed up there um, that the United States detonated only s relatively small uh, nuclear weapons compared with the energy that's released in, in asteroids slamming into the Earth. Um, so we, we only have a rough idea about energy and crater size. And so we're sort of extrapolating from those results. In fact, the author in one of those papers said that um, it would be, we do not have enough data at, in terms of large crater sizes and the energy it would take. And he said, I pray to God we never do because you know setting off those size explosives could be extremely dangerous. Um, the, other, the other formula that I'm gonna be using, there's several formulas I'll use today beside the relationship between energy and crater diameter is kinetic energy. Anybody that's taken a, a physics class um, knows that the kinetic energy is equal to the mass of an object times its uh, velocity squared divided by two. All right, so we'll be using that, those two formulas. 
All right. Um, the other thing that we're going to be using, another formula we'll be using in this is the density formula that most people know. Density, I use the, the, form, the symbol RHO for density is equal to the mass divided by the volume, uh, where uh, V is the volume of the object. Uh, we're assuming that the object that was coming in was spherical. And again, we don't know. We just don't have it. I, I wish we did have the impacting object, but we don't. We're assuming that that was uh, spherical in shape. If it wasn't, then that could alter these uh, calculations as well. If it's spherical, then we know the volume is equal to 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. Um, and so what, what I did, or what George did, I said, I'm not going to take um, any credit for this because I didn't actually do the math, but I'm going to do the best I can to explain it. And again, George is, you know, is welcome to, to chime in here. Oh, good. All right, George is saying, physicists always make the assumption of a spherically symmetric homogeneous chicken. <laughs> okay. All right, so we've got, um, like I said, four formulas so far. All right, and um, what I'm going to be doing on this graphic here, whoops, all right, is I start, or as George did, he put, um, I believe, the uh, form, volume formula, yeah, the volume of a sphere into the uh, density formula. So we arrive at the equation mass is equal to pi over 6 diameter to the third power times the density. All right. Um, if we combine the, yeah, if we combine the kinetic energy formula, energy is equal to mass, one-half mass times the velocity squared, uh, we come up with equation 4, energy is equal to pi divided by 12 times the density times um, the diameter of the asteroid to the third power times the velocity squared. All right. And again, this is why I said get my note, uh, the note card that's in there. All right. If you want to go through and check the algebra. All right. Um, the next thing that we have to assume here is we've got to get a relationship between the asteroid diameter and the crater diameter. All right. And George put in some densities of uh, C, S, and M class asteroids. Uh, I'm not sure what C, S, and M stand for, uh, but he said that uh, C is, I, I bet those are carbonaceous asteroids, uh, 1.38. Uh, S was 2.71, and M worth 5.32. Okay, here we go. Yes, C is chondritic, M is metallic, and um, S is silicates. Thanks. All right, which um, I'm a little surprised. I thought that the metallic ones would be a little bit higher, but we can talk about that later. Okay, and so he's using an average density of somewhere around 3 for the calculations uh, that we're going to be doing here. All right, so the next question is, how fast was the object um, moving, okay, when it slammed into the Earth? And the typical speed uh, that we assume for objects that impact uh, the Earth is 18 kilometers per second. And uh, I do like the metric system, but I also like to think in terms of the English system because I'm in America. So I did some math this morning and found out that's about uh, 40,000 miles per hour in terms of the speed of impact. But because we're dealing with metrics, we're going to stick with the 18 kilometers per second. So assume an average uh, velocity of 18 kilometers per second. The density is 3. And now we've got to convert from kilometers to centimeters because the density is in centimeters uh, per milliliter. Yeah, okay. I'm going to get to that in a minute, says G. Bear with me here, all right? Um, and you and George can be fighting this out because I'm not sure about the speed of impact of these objects. All right, um, we're converting from kilometers to centimeters, so we've got to use a 10 to the 15th conversion factor here. So what we end up with is uh, combining these formulas. Energy is equal to 3. Density divided by 3. CGS times pi divided by 12 
times 10 to the 15th, the conversion factor time, raised uh, to 3 times 1.8 times 10 to the 6 times 2 ergs. All right, or if we simplify that, we get E is equal to 2.54 times 10 to the 27th times uh, D uh, raised 3 uh, ergs. And again, we could simplify that further. And again, um, this is just Algebra 2 math if you want to check me later. Um, we eventually arrive at the formula that uh, the diameter of an asteroid is equal to 1.53 times 3 divided by the density times the crater diameter raised to the 0.86 power. All right. And we know that the Millsboro Crater is somewhere around four miles. I heard different estimates. Um, some residents say it's 3.67, but let's use four miles. So that would give us a crater diameter of 6.4 kilometers. Uh, that works. Um, so if we put that into equation five, we end up with um, the asteroid size would have been around 0.75 kilometers or 0.47 miles, say half a mile in diameter. <laughs> All right, by the way, in front of me, or in front of the slide projector here, okay, and to my right, um, being at the second life, I couldn't resist uh, getting a 3D model of a meteorite crater. And uh, I put, if you look carefully, I put a gray meteorite in the size of it. So, um, yeah, if you want to get roughly an idea of the relationship of size, because I don't want to just get bogged down in all the math, and I probably move through it faster than I should. Um, you know, this will give you an idea in terms of the three-dimensional geometry. All right, now, this assumes an average density of three for the asteroid. Yeah, scissors saying, so you end up with a meteorite diameter that's roughly a factor of 10 smaller than the meteor crate, which is more or less correct ratio. Yeah, a lot of people I talk to say they like that, that uh, size. All right, one of the things that I worried about was some of the uncertainties, and I've talked to Curious George as well about this. You know, um, we're assuming an average density of three for the asteroid. Um, if it was denser than that, um, than that of a stony meteorite or whatever. Uh, what if it was around six, all right? Uh, what effect would that have on these calculations? And the answer is that would be, if you've got, if you double the density, if you're dealing with a metallic um, asteroid rather than a, than a rocky one, then the size is cut in half. And again, we don't know. The object that came in and slammed in Millsboro Crater, we don't know when it hit and we, don't know what its composition is, we don't know the density, we don't know the bulk density, any of that, um, which creates a problem in some of these calculations. And so I, I've listed, or I've got some pictures of some of the uh, meteorites that have struck Kentucky. So we do have some of those. So this is a picture of a chondritic silicate rich meteorite. And some of the minerals that have been found in uh, chondritic meteorites include orthopyroxene, olivine, plegioclase, feldspar. Um, they make up 85% of the meteorites that have been found. And again, what's interesting is if you look at these minerals, olivine, plage, orthopyroxenes, these are minerals that vary greatly, okay, in terms of um, their, uh, miner their chemical composition and also their density. So for example, and I listed this at the bottom of the slide here, um, plagioclase is about 2.68 grams per milliliter. Olivine is three. And they said some plagioclases get up to six, which I was surprised. Um, almost, you know, the point of, of metals is, as Curious George was saying. And we've also have um, some achondrites. Uh, they lack the chondrules of chondritic meteorites. Um, here's a stony meteorite that's been found in um, in um, Kentucky, and I would think that iron would get you up to around eight or nine. George, you're saying that the density, because there are other materials, uh, uh, iron-rich meteorites are more in the six range for density. Yeah, 
maybe. All right. Um, again, we don't know what the objects were that struck uh, Billsburg, Kentucky. Um, but uh, there have been 27 meteorites that have been recovered from Kentucky. So I give you a, a pie chart uh, breakdown of uh, the composition of those. Maybe they give us an indication of what, um, um, you know, what the object was that struck Millsboro. Maybe it didn't. But uh, of the meteorites that have been recovered from Kentucky, 33% are stony, 7% are ironstone, and 60% are the iron-rich ones. So, um, yeah, okay, I hadn't thought of that, George, but that's true. Okay, the higher density ones are the ones that are going to be more likely to survive. All right, so um, basically the thing that I want to say here is that it's really important to have these sort of collaborative projects and take a look at uh, you know, a, a field area like Billsburg, Kentucky, for both the geology um, and also the astrophysics. And it's been a real pleasure to work with uh, George so that I can understand physics a little better. Um, certainly, there are a lot of uncertainties here in terms of what was the impact speed? Um, you know, what was the object that even struck? And that can um, control uh, the size of the object that impacted. But certainly, I think somewhere in the quarter of a mile to a half a mile range seems reasonable from the numbers that we're seeing here. All right. Well, that's what I thought. All right. One thing that I was thinking about and came up repeatedly um, in the um, discussion that I had with people um, in Millsburg, Kentucky is, you know, why would anybody want to come to Millsburg, Kentucky? And the answer I came up with is um, NASA. Um, and for a couple of years, I worked with the folks at um, um, Langley um, Center in Virginia. And one of the things that people were interested in is, you know, uh, of course, is establishing a colony on the moon. And um, in order for us to do a colony on the moon or maybe on, go on to Mars to establish a base there as well, we need to carefully consider the materials that are going to be present on those, um, on those planetary bodies because it's very expensive getting materials from the Earth to a colony, whether it's on the moon or Mars. And so we would have to have some kind of insight to mining operation that would be going on um, either on the moon or Mars. And one of the things that struck me when I was going through Millsburg, Kentucky, is that this would be a perfect spot, okay, to study what it would be like to try and do mining um, in an asteroid field, right? Because basically, um, you know, they've already done it. Uh, Millsburg, Kentucky was the site of mining for many years, um, and they even had uh, some of the old mining equipment on display. Of course, uh, coal is the, one of the main products that they got out of, out of Millsburg, Kentucky. Uh, but they also got some iron. But here's the problem that people notice uh, when they start doing mining around uh, Kentucky, is that in some cases the resources uh, pitched out very quickly. And when I was in the asteroid uh, crater, it was very clear why that would be. And I took this image. You know, and compare this to the one that I showed you earlier in the talk, you know, where in many cases, if you go to, say, um, Pennsylvania, or you go to out west, there's coal in Wyoming, you see nice flat layers of coal. So you can go in there, you can remove the overburden and then do strip mining, or you can do underground mining, and you've got these nice flat layers that are easy to calculate how much mine is there. But because of the, of the asteroid impact, these coal and other resource layers have been fractured, you know, and it struck me. Take a look at that black coal layer that's in the middle of that slide there. You know, that you get these sort of triangular features that are present there, um, and maybe they're related to uh, uh, other cracks. Or Now, this would make more sense if you've got a 60-degree angle um, in some of those, those faults that are there that we're getting to earlier. But in terms of a mining, this is tricky 
because you're going down, oh, yeah, there's a pocket of coal. Well, I can take that out. But then it pinches out. So you get only these small local accumulations. And I suspect we're going to run into this problem on Mars or the moon where we've got heavily cratered surfaces. Um, and it, obviously we're not going to be looking for coal up there because there's not a lot of organic matter on the moon or, or uh, Mars. But certainly we could be looking for valuable uh, mineral resources like iron and so on. And I would expect them to perhaps peter out like this as well. All right, this is just a reference that I threw up there. Um, like I said, my, um, my information is in there, and we've gone for a little more than a half an hour, and I've already seen some uh, good comments and questions that are thrown on there. Yeah, discovery of coal on the moon would be a big deal. Um, yeah, don't, don't expect to see it happen. So um, do you have other questions or comments that you want to put in? Like I said, when I do these talks, I try and keep them around 30 minutes um, so that we can get question and answers in and everybody can get out of here in an hour. So go ahead, hit the local chat. All right. Um, are you talking about rare earth metals uh, from meteorites? Uh, Ariane, I suspect, yeah, I suspect that there are some valuable rare earth elements that are present on, uh, in asteroids. And I know that there are companies that are planning on actually sending up, uh, probes intersecting some of these asteroids, mining them. So there are things like neodymium and whatnot that we can use, for example, cell phones that are relatively rare on the earth that it makes sense to try and mine them. I definitely think that's a great idea. Uh, what has happened geologically in the area since the impact? Um, are you talking about the Millsboro, Kentucky area? The answer is not much. Um, like I said, we don't have any layers immediately on top of the crater. I wish we did. Um, all we've got are these carboniferous layers that date around 300 million. So we know the impact had to occur after that, but you know, other than that, I, I wish I had more information, but I don't. Like I said, it would be really cool to look into. Did it have any impact or effect on um, mass extinction on the Earth? Oh, that's a bummer, George. I was hoping you would say that the rare earth elements were uh, were more common in asteroids. One of the things that uh, we are looking at is, I know in terms of the rare earth elements, one of the things that I've heard from the um, Virginia Geological Society, they call the something else these days, is they're looking for rare earth elements mixed in with sediments um, in the coastal plain of Virginia and other areas. They, they go out with uh, dredges um, on boats and they pull up sand and they're finding out there's quite a bit of rare earth elements mixed in. And they have this thing that looks like a water slide where they run the water and the sediment through. They separate the sand from the heavier materials and they can um, extract them that way. Well, all of the heavier elements come from supernova explosions and the ratios and their abundances are set by whatever nuclear physics goes on there. So it will be the same everywhere, whether it's interior of the Earth or, or asteroids or anything like that. Right. Yes. But again, you know, uh, the ratios of different elemental abundances is given by the nuclear physics, and it doesn't matter where you look for them. Not the lighter elements, of course. The universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, and then things like carbon, oxygen, ni nitrogen, sun, they get produced in lower mass stars. The really heavy ones, metals and all that, in big star explosions and or neutron star collisions. saying there's another crater in Ohio that hit about the same time within 20 million years. Is that one 
more constrained in terms of time, Phil, because again, we don't have a lot of constraints on the Millsboro, Kentucky one. I just looking at this one that shows some of the larger impact craters, the one that in um, chat. There just seems to be a bunch of them in that area within about 20 million years. I mean, that's a long time, but they're all around the same time period. Okay. Yeah, feel for, I, I don't have a problem if people want to turn their voice on and, and make comments. I think that might be a little bit easier than just the, uh, the text chat. It was the immediacy of your question, otherwise it'd be lost in chat, several chats back. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm planning on saving this whole chat line, going back over it and seeing questions and comments when I get a chance. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments uh, that you want to make about this talk? Uh, one thing I would I would say before people start booking out of here is that I'm looking at um, the schedule, and I believe there's going to be um, there's going to be a meeting next. Where's my calendar? Next next Saturday, right? Yeah, next Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, SLT time, March 4th, is going to be the planning meeting for uh, Project Moonbase that Second Life uh, Science Circle is doing. So I encourage all of you to come back if you're interested in astronomy and whatnot. Um, I think that um, this topic of uh, Moonbase is a very exciting one. I'm looking forward to working with Tab Scott and the other people involved with that. All right, and I was asked about my slides. Uh, if you have not clicked the box underneath the slide projector, click there. You will get a note card, and at the very beginning of the note card, there should be the location of my slides. If it's not in there, let me check. Well, uh, one thing you guys may find interesting that uh, by now we have maybe like three cases where a small asteroid was observed from the Earth with, with a telescope and then hit the Earth. But all of them were small, like the size of a car, typically, and they all disintegrated the upper atmosphere. I worked on a project um, where, which was doing just that, and the first time it happened, they figured out where they would disintegrate, so they sent people to, uh, to go and look for pieces, which they found. It was somewhere over the desert in Sudan. They got students from a local university to go there and look for black rocks on the yellow sand, and I think they found a couple hundred pieces. So my friends were joking that that was the cheapest ever asteroid uh, sample return mission. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments about uh, the talk? Um, I missed it, Phil.
found many amino acids in the sample from asteroids. Some discussion about the origin of a living thing on the Earth. Bring in my, yeah, preservation of amino acids, I imagine, would be hard to get preserved. I mean, there's a mission, the Perseverance rover right now, that's running around the surface of the Mars, collecting samples. It gets put it in a container. And, um, and then hopefully by 2030, we're going to go and we're going to recover uh, those samples. Um, I think those would have a greater chance of being preserved, and I would love to get my hands on it and see if there's any fossil evidence in it. everybody else, um, but I kind of doubt that that will happen. Of course, every once in a while, you see some crackpot looking at a picture from a rover saying, oh, look, here is a Coke bottle or whatever. Conspiracy theorists, of course, we face all those images of JPL, and some people carelessly leave their lunch remains there. I don't want to know that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Max, it was it was a lot of fun to actually do geology and asteroid credit. It's something that was a bucket list thing that I always thought would be cool to do, but never thought I'd get the chance to do it. This is Tagline. May I make an announcement? This is, hello? Okay, thank you. Uh, this coming Wednesday um, at 5, 5 p.m. PST, um, on the 1st of March. Um, a math club, mathematics club of science circle starts up. I just put it in here and we have a permanent site for this, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And um, let's see, I want to, oh, I, I always have to figure out how to, I'm going to quickly share this uh, with everyone here, um, if I can. Uh, and this will be... Um, not too weird, not too esoteric, I hope. And I've sent this uh, 
site out uh, before, but I, I hope um, that worked and um, that uh, people can see where that is. And everyone is welcome to join us. Uh, it'll go for one hour and I'm going to be sort of st strict about not going over. And um, I'm going to try to keep it uh, comprehensible, intelligible, uh, not too uh, arcane and uh, uh, buried in jargon. So we'd love to see you there if you can join us. And that's it. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we'll make our we'll make our own jargon. I'm I'm welcoming anyone present to join in open discussion by Matt Mike. We'll see how that works on the start, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm heading out. Thank you all for coming and look forward to seeing you um, uh, next week for the uh, Moonbase Alpha and the I've got to thanks tagline reminding me about the math club. <laughs>